Welcome back, everyone. My name is Sam. And I'm Melissa. I grew up in the FLDS community. It is a polygamous group run by Warren Jeffs, and I moved out when I was 18 years old. I was raised LDS. Sam and I have been married for nine years and have two awesome kiddos. Yes, we do. We want to quickly thank our donors, YouTube members, and our patrons on Patreon. We really do appreciate your support. Yes, we do. Today we are back with Secrets of Polygamy. This episode was hmm. a pretty heavy one because it was talking about child brides and it was particularly talking about the FLDS, which is where Sam came from. Yeah. Also, I'd like to pre-apologize for my voice. If you can't hear me, I'm losing my voice. So sorry about that. If I sound super quiet. Sounds sounds great. Okay, I, like, I like the new sound. <laughs> so yes, this one was challenging for me to, I wouldn't say relive, but revisit because of the heartbreak and the frustration that comes with what happened within the FLDS in particular. And also these types of things have happened elsewhere, but this episode focused on the FLDS and what was going on there. The older man taking very much underage girls as their wives, in some cases forcing them to do it. So just very, very frustrating to hear this experience being retold. Yeah, and they did focus a lot on the fact that um, younger teenage girls being married to older men is something that's happened clear back for a long time within the FLDS, you know, marrying girls at 16, 17, 18. In Utah, you have to be 18 to be married unless you have parental consent, and then you can be at 16 or 17. And so they were kind of talking about the history of the church, like there's been lots of 16, 17 year olds yeah. being married, the age of the man never really mattered as much, you know, like it could be older men, but then it really got a lot worse with Warren Jeffs. And so they just talked about him taking it to the extreme and all of a sudden 12, 13, 14 year old girls were being offered up for marriage. They did bring up a couple of things that I don't know if we've ever talked about before on our channel. So. It's good to bring those things to light, but just kind of going through, they talked about the fact that um, like Alicia, she shared her story. She's the niece of Winston Blackmore mm -hmm. up in the Canada area. Yeah, they're in, in Bountiful. And mm -hmm. yes, yeah, so that was a whole other group of the FLDS, but they were very much a part of the FLDS for a long time. Uh, when I was living in Short Creek, we always heard about the Canadian group. We always, we would even hear sermons from Winston Blackmore, who was the bishop of the FLDS in that branch. So she was a part of that group uh, living up there in Canada. Yeah. And one thing that I didn't know, this is kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but they were talking um, to kind of the Canadian FBI later, and they were talking about the fact that these underage girls being sent from the Canada group across the border to be married off in like by Warren or to Warren, they were able later to prosecute because of the fact they were saying that these women, these girls were being sent across borders for the purpose of illegal child sex trafficking. Yeah. And that's how they were able to go after people in the Canadian group and even parents went to prison because they were able to convict them for sending their child. And they said, I thought it was interesting. I didn't know that Canada had done that. Mm -hmm. They were able to use documents from the YFC um, ranch raid and be able to prove they even went to Warren Cell to ask like clarifying questions. Uh, and when he didn't want to answer, they were able to use that as evidence of it not being hearsay, but that it really happened. And they were able to use that. And they're like, if anything, we wanted the polygamists in Canada to be fearful of the law if they sent their children down to be married across the borders. And I thought, what a good way for law enforcement to be able to help the people in that community say no. Hmm. Not that they, tech, I mean, you never know whether or not they'll say no or if they'll say God's law is above the laws of the land. But hopefully that did help by the law enforcement saying this is now, we're going to go after you to the full extent of the law if you let your children go and get married within this religion. Yeah, and it did happen. And there were even some men that stood up against Warren Jeffs when Warren wanted to take their very young girl, 12 years old. Was it Alicia? It was Alicia. So Alicia was 12 when Warren wanted to take wanted her, to take her. Oh. for his wife. After talking to her, he would call, Warren would call her when she was like six, seven years old and ask her how she was doing, if she was being a good girl, if she was listening to her father, which how, like, oh, we already know Warren is just an evil man. 
But to have the amount of time and effort to be constantly thinking, like he has like 75 wives at this time. Why does he feel the need to groom these next children everywhere around him? He was he was fixated on that one thing, having more wives. It seemed like, and uh, especially the ones that he thought he couldn't have, he tried harder and f- focused on those ones. For example, Alicia's dad here told him no, because and I was like, oh wow, that's amazing that he actually stood up to him. Because so many of these uh, fathers in the FLDS and mothers will just, or at least we all assume that they just go along with it because, you know, it's coming from the prophet. Therefore, it must be good. But in this instance, he's, the father of Alicia said, no, she's only 12 years old. If, she needs to be in my house till she's of age, and then you can yeah, marry her then. He said it would be an honor for her to marry the prophet of God because he did believe that Warren was the prophet of God. But he said, he still said, this isn't right. God wouldn't command this. So I was like, that's amazing. But of course, Warren being the cunning, convincing master evil mind that he was and is, he in a roundabout way convinced him to let her go to the ranch to be with him, but promised that he would not marry her until she was of age. Well, and the type of manipulation, like the spiritual manipulation, when he called back two weeks later, when Warren called back two weeks later, he said the devil was going to destroy her if she didn't join Warren's household. So I'm not going to marry her, but she needs to be under my care or else she's going to be destroyed, right? So spiritual manipulation. And I promise that she'll be under the care of her sisters because Warren already had married two of her older sisters. So let her come here. She'll be with her sisters. I'm not going to marry her. God's going to destroy her if you don't. And so he agreed. Yeah. thinking that she was going to be safe. And, and people might wonder, well, that's just creepy. Why would anyone believe that? Why would anyone believe that that God would destroy her, that, that allow Satan to destroy her unless she was under the care of this Warren Jeffs that was, oh man, I, it's hard to even talk about him. Uh, but you have to remember that even though he stood up against him, and in a way that was respectful, you know, it's not like it's not like he just told Warren, no, you, you can't marry my daughter. He said, I, this doesn't feel right to me that you would marry someone until she's of, a, of age, because, of course, he loves her daughter. He, he loves his daughter. But he still believed that Warren Jess was a prophet of God. And so when Warren came with the Satan destruction and if you don't give her to me, then he ultimately believed him. Yeah, I will say the one good thing about obviously her having a good relationship with her father, you know, she got to the ranch, she was cut off from communication with her dad, and Warren married her like the next week. But she said like, as she would be, you know, Warren would come to her bedroom and pick her up and try to carry her to his room. Because again, she's 12 years old. And she would say no, no, my dad said no, my dad said not yet, my dad said not yet. And while Warren was furious that he would i think he quote he quoted said like you'd go with your dad over the prophet why would you go with what your dad says over the prophet but she did she said she'd kind of like fight back and say no you told my dad and my dad said i didn't have to do anything until i was of age and so having a father that w- did love her and was trying to protect her obviously had an impact and made it so that she yeah. had that fight in her still. It makes me wonder how many other mothers and fathers of children in the FLDS did try to stand up against Warren Jeffs. Here's the tricky thing, though, and I think I mentioned this to you when we were watching it, is at this point, the mothers and fathers of these children have been teaching their children, convincing their children, fathers convincing their wives that Warren Jeffs is a prophet of God. Because until this point, they hadn't experienced Warren doing something like trying to take one of their very young girls from them. Mm -hmm. So they are all in, just like I was. I was all in, and my parents had convinced me that Warren Jeffs was a prophet of God. So now Warren Jeffs comes and says that God commanded him to do something. If one of those parents that have convinced their children that he's a prophet of God say no and try to stand up against him, suddenly that can split up the whole family because the children and the wives could look at that husband and father and say, oh, he's standing up against the prophet of God because they're convinced that he's the prophet of God. And so they could stop trusting him 
because he tries to stand up against Warren. It was very much, it was so hard to try to stand up against Warren Jeffs because so many people, so many families and community members were convinced and like myself had not seen the bad side of Warren. And so there was no reason for us to think that he wasn't a prophet of God. Yeah, I think Rachel Jeffs even had mentioned that there were guys that they didn't want to take underage brides. And when Warren would call and say, you're going to marry this 13-year-old girl, they had to because they weren't going to say no because then they would be taken away and kicked out from all of their other wives and children, their family, their community. So there were lots of men that were forced to take underage brides as well that didn't even want to right? because of the whole situation and Warren executing his power over everybody, right? So it's just a super bad situation. She did, Alicia shared a lot more about, um, we've talked about before, like heavenly sessions have been Mm. in certain documentaries. She called it prepping. She said she didn't get prepped the way that the other women would get prepped before they would marry Warren. And it was like an intense thing where they were told exactly what Warren liked. And she talked about, Um, without getting graphic, I'll just say basically the orgies that they would have as these heavenly sessions to get prepped for marriage with Warren. And it was just, again, Alicia had mentioned, and we've mentioned before, it's so sad to see that, like she said, these other women, like these are adults and they're allowing and watching and participating in the harm of children. And they're all mothers and so how, which person was it, was, was it in the documentary that talked about being in heavenly session and then seeing like a 12 or 13 year old girl in there and just instantly feeling like this isn't right. Like, why is there a child yeah. in here with us doing this? But then you feel like you're implicit in the crime and then they feel guilt and shame for what they've done. And so they're in a cycle of not wanting to leave or right, because if admit you, that it's wrong or admit that it wasn't what God wanted yeah. because then what you did, you know, is just evil. Right. If you admit or accept that Warren Jeffs isn't a prophet of God, then suddenly all of the stuff that you were convinced to do, assuming that God wanted it done that way, mm-hmm. is now just evil. And so I can't, I can't imagine how hard that would be to walk away from the belief in Warren because of the what that would mean ultimately if yeah. he was no longer a prophet of God. Yeah, we recently talked to one of Warren Jeff's children that had left recently, and they said that they think that's one of the reasons why most of Warren Jeff's wives have stayed. Mm. Because he's had like, I think he has like 78 wives at this point. Only about 15 have left. You're right. And most of them have stayed. And this kid said that they thought it was because of the things they had seen and they're worried about it, what it would mean if it wasn't true which is just heartbreaking and this is they've stayed now still believing in him and he's been in prison for uh, what is it 16 years more than that 17 years he a long time he was put in prison in 2000 and i want to say originally six yes but not in texas that was in utah and then he was in utah for a little bit but he's been in prison a very long time right Yeah, so So, crazy. Alicia overheard Warren telling her sisters, do whatever it takes to break her. She said, luckily, that just encouraged her not to be broken. Um, In 2013, she was sent to isolation for two years in a house in the woods completely by herself. Again, to like mentally break these women. They were Mm -hmm. sent to houses of hiding, isolation. She finally got to go back and live with her mom because her father had passed away. Warren didn't allow them to go to their father's funeral. Again, power move because they were picking their father over Warren. Mm -hmm. And then she did leave the FLDS in 2016, which was, you know, a comforting ending. At least she was able to be free and live a happy life now. Right. Yeah, it was so sad, too. She said that Warren told her and her sisters after their father had passed away that he was this evil person and written letters from prison he's in prison yeah and so instead of saying oh my gosh i'm so sorry your father passed away you know and that kind of thing he doesn't let him go to the funeral and then he set tries to claim that he's this evil person to these girls that look back very fondly on their father and the experiences they had with him and there was in their eyes there was no evil person in him 
and Warren Jeffs, once again, just trying to have all the power and control and convince them that he was some bad person. Alicia even even said that it was almost like Warren was afraid of their dad. So once he passed away, then he finally started saying everything he wished he could say earlier. So yeah. it's just it's just so heartbreaking for these young girls. Yeah, it's so sad. I mean, thank goodness Warren Jeffs is behind bars. But unfortunately, that doesn't mean that the cycle is like stopping because right. Warren, we know right now, is preparing to start um, marriages again because marriages were stopped for a long time. And with that, we are hoping that bringing awareness to the situation will make it less likely for the child bride situation to yeah. recur and start up again, hopefully. Even within the FLDS, the other person that they brought up was Samuel Bateman. And we had done stuff on, he is still awaiting trial, so he hasn't been convicted, but there's no bail. He's... Yeah, and he's been awaiting trial for quite some time now. Yeah, and we'll definitely, so. as new information comes up on Samuel Bateman, we'll try to cover that as that unfolds and we hear all of the things that were going on. Yeah, but because it's an ongoing investigation, the information we have is so limited. They're just, authorities are not willing to talk much about it yet, so... Yeah, but... He's facing 50 felonies, though, 50 felonies. And they said that the things that were heard about this case, they couldn't give the details, but were so horrific that it was making like law enforcement sick. And law enforcement couldn't, couldn't finish the story when they were telling investigators about it because they couldn't get through the... The things that were happening. Craziness of everything and the Im immorality that was going on within this group and and these are law enforcement people these are people that see the see worst stuff. of the worst yeah and so that just says something and you know and, and after knowing what warren jeffs was doing it, they almost made it sound like what samuel bateman was doing was worse somehow and i'm just like whoa whoa it just oh yeah. and to know how i don't did they say how many people got caught up in his little I had heard it was about 100. Okay. It's like 120, somewhere in there. Samuel Bateman, so he basically came out and said, Warren is not in prison. He's no longer in this life. So he was trying to tell people, Warren's dead. You should follow me. I'm the new prophet. There were families who fell for it. We have family members out there that didn't fall for it, thank goodness. But right. we're brought, you know, like Samuel Bateman tried, tried to come to convince and them. convince them. Yep. And they said no. This story was told by a girl named Dolly, and she's 19. And she was talking about the fact that her parents followed Samuel Bateman. Samuel Bateman took her mother as a wife, and then her dad went and found somebody else. But and then it, her younger sisters got married to Samuel Bateman as well. Correct me if I misunderstood this, but it sounded like that Dolly's father convinced her mother to leave him to go be with Samuel Bateman. I think he convinced her to join Samuel Bateman's group. Okay. And then once they were joined, then she married Samuel and he had to go find a different woman. It just so, but it did sound like that, like yeah. that it was the father who was like, we need to follow Samuel. And then... Anyway, and then he ended up oh, taking the man. wife and some of the daughters. Now, Samuel Bateman was caught with a bunch of young underage girl, and we're talking super young, like as young as 10, in a trailer mm -hmm. hooked up to the back of his truck. And they were able to, somebody called and saw like fingers poking out of the, the trailer. So someone called law enforcement, stopped him, and they were able to start this investigation. Thank goodness. But they were told, that family was told, like, if you don't join, or sorry, Dolly was told, if you don't join, the people you love will die. So she was being threatened again. I mean, I don't say again for her, but just this spiritual manipulation, you know, destruction. It's always destruction, right? right. You're going to die. People you love will die. Bad things are going to happen if you don't do what I say as a prophet. So she did join yeah. for a little bit, and then she ended up leaving. But even her mom which had, um, you know, she said two of her sisters were married to Samuel Bateman. But the mom is facing 12 felonies and is in prison. And the dad is facing eight felonies. And they're all in jail, so, which tells me whatever happened to those young daughters, all of those adults were responsible. And they're all being prosecuted as they should. Yeah, I, I often say within the FLDS church, when I was growing up out there, there were a lot of really good people just trying to live the best life they could. 
uh, unfortunately, they were being forced to do things that I'm sure most of them wished that they didn't have to do, but they were using this manipulation, like, you know, your loved ones will die, your, all the different tactics that, that they would use to convince people and scare people into doing awful things. And, you know, just like the movies, you know, they just they, they convince people to do things because they're in fear for their loved ones. Mm -hmm. And but within this small group of about 100 people that Samuel Bateman gathered up and started to lead, it seemed like most of the adults and I'm not saying every but most of the adults were at fault here. Yeah. And so I don't know how many of them weren't. All of the children, the innocent young children, were being obviously con convinced and coerced into doing these awful things. But the adults were definitely all, and we can see because they're also being put in prison for things they were doing. Yeah, and the children are just being abused. Like oh, at yeah. 10, you can't, I mean, they, there's not even convincing a 10 year old. It's just, we've heard stories. And abuse. We've heard some stories about what might have been going on within the group, within Samuel Bateman and all of that. And just like we had mentioned, it's not even something I feel comfortable talking about in public. Like It actually makes me sick. And I imagine that law enforcement knows a lot more that we haven't heard. So, uh, man, all of this, all of this stuff is just so hard to talk about. So... Sorry, okay. sorry, it's taken us a minute to get through all this information because it's such a heavy topic. How do you even talk about it? But I think the reason why we still want to talk about it, even though it's so hard to get through, is because the more people that know that this is something, the more people can be aware. Yeah. And someone had to call when they saw someone possibly being in a trailer. Someone mm. called and made all the difference yep. for all of those girls, right? Someone has to call Canadian law enforcement, finding a way to be able to scare the people more than the profit could scare them. There are ways that we as society, as a community, as a country, we can help people be more aware of the fact that it's not okay for children to be in these situations, even if it's religious. Right. You know, it doesn't matter. Like children are children and they need to be protected at all costs. And so it's only with awareness that people can keep an eye out and help try to protect those kids. Cause it's yeah. easy to just be like, Oh, those are just, you know, it's just, they're doing something different over there, but whatever, I'm going to live my life over here. But when you know, there's a possibility for abuse, it leaves that opportunity for you to have that compassion and kindness yeah. and, and look for opportunities to help. So exactly. Yeah. And to go into it, knowing that in a lot of cases, at least people, these people that are in this, aren't always looking for help. So it's hard to just, you know, you see someone that you think might be in a bad situation, you can't always just run up and try to create a scene to help them escape or something like that. That's just unfortunately not how it works when it is all based around religion. Because in their, I mean, I can speak for myself, in a young boy's little mind, God sees all, you make one mistake against the prophet of the church, and that's it for you. And so in some cases, you have to go about it very carefully. You can't just, you know, a phone call. A phone call to authorities is probably the best option if you see a really bad situation or something that could potentially be a bad situation. And kindness in the meantime. Almost every single person that we've ever met that has left can tell you the one time that an outsider or Gentile at that time in their life was kind and made them think, oh, these people aren't evil. Kindness yes. is the biggest thing that any person can do to help any of these people. Yeah. Yeah. If you have an opportunity to see them or interact with uh, people in, in any way that you think might be in a bad situation, yes, 100% correct. That was the same for me, same for so many people I've talked about, loving, kind outsiders opens the eyes to those that are inside to realize, oh, there might be some good people out in this world that we were told were not good. And that just starts the wheels turning. Next thing you know, there's all these questions and they may be, may be running for help.
And if anybody out there that is watching this is in a situation where they need help getting out of a, a dangerous situation or a situation that they don't feel comfortable with, then please reach out. You can reach out to us below in our email. You can reach out to Holding Out Help. They have great resources yep. to be able to help people, especially people leaving polygamous communities. But please, you know, reach out. Yeah. And if it doesn't feel good in your heart, listen to your gut. Yeah. Yeah, we would love to support in any way we can. So yes, feel free to reach out if there's something you think we can do to help out or if you just need someone to talk to. Yes, so. absolutely. And if you want to hear more of what it was like for Sam to grow up in polygamy, please like and subscribe. Yes, thank you all so much for being here with us again today. We look forward to talking with you soon. Talk to y'all soon. <laughs>